Hello everyone and welcome to another video. Today I'd like to talk about the wonderful world of rotating reference frames. Now you may have seen this before under the moniker of Coriolis effect and or centrifugal acceleration. Some explanations I've seen give a very simple physical demonstration of the scenario followed by an even simpler hand-waving explanation of what's going on. On the other end of the spectrum, I've seen other professors give a very detailed, rigorous analysis of the scenario accompanied by abstract coordinate frames, vectors, and... Over the course of two separate videos, I'd like to provide an explanation that falls somewhere in between. So in this particular video, I'd like to approach this first as just a simple physics demonstration. So in other words, let's just go out and observe the phenomena without trying to understand it. This also gives us an excellent excuse to go out and fly some drones to try to capture a unique perspective of the scenario. Once we've observed the effect and seen how it operates, in a following video, we'll go ahead and provide a rigorous engineering analysis of the situation. So, if all of this sounds like more fun than an unsupervised visit to the Taco Bell Taste Testing Center, then let's go ahead and get started. Now I've seen examples where people build rotating reference frames using huge metal beams with seats mounted on the end and it's all spinning on a bearing and it might even be powered by an electric motor, but I've actually got two small kids and we spend a ton of time here at this park and this is one of the best rotating reference frames that I'm able to find. It's just your classic toy, a children's merry-go-round. So to get a better view of the merry-go-round, we flew a drone above the playground and recorded as we set up the scene. So let's consider two participants slash observers in this scenario. So one of them is standing on the non-rotating ground. Let's call this the reference frame. So to help us remember that this is the reference frame, let's name this observer Randall. R for Randall and R for reference frame. So the white pipes there are used to represent Randall's X and Y axis. And I know it might be a little bit hard to see, but these cards that are being placed on the ground are used to label this as Randall's point of view. And now you see that we're placing a camera here, which is attached to this non-rotating reference frame, and we're going to use it to gather Randall's point of view. Now the second observer is one that's attached to the merry-go-round. This is typically referred to as the body frame, and to help us remember that this is the body frame, let's name this observer Brian. B for Brian and B for body frame. So the gray pipes now represent Brian's X and Y axes, and again, we're trying to label this here with uh, white cards that notify us that this is Brian's reference frame on the merry-go-round. And again, what we want to do here is set up another camera, which is now attached to the rotating reference frame and is going to be used to gather Brian's point of view. So you see, we're placing that camera right there. This is the one that's going to be a little bit interesting because we're going to see what they see. And this is basically the setup we have. So we've got the non-rotating reference frame down there in the bottom left as the white pipes. And again, that observer down there, we're calling him Randall. And then uh, attached to the merry-go-round, we have another reference frame called the body frame or Brian. And we're going to gather viewpoints from both of these perspectives as we move forward. So let's jump over and see uh, a couple of interesting scenarios from both of these points of view. Let's start with a simple situation where nothing is rotating. If Brian and Randall are playing a simple game of catch and throwing this ball back and forth, nothing odd happens, right? The ball travels as you would expect. Now, let's watch this again, and we'll also slow it down. Now, let's add the drone's overhead view of the scene. Throughout the rest of the video, we're going to use these red transparent arrows to show the ball's trajectory. So again, this should look totally normal to you, right? If we examine the trajectory in the XY plane, as soon as the ball leaves the thrower's hand, it follows a perfectly straight line. Now let's start the body frame rotating. In other words, let's start spinning Brian. Again, we'll get the drone's overhead perspective but leave it stationary. Therefore, both the main camera and the overhead camera are effectively Randall's non-rotating point of view. And again, everything's normal. As soon as the ball leaves Brian's hand, it follows a straight line as you would expect. So everything seemed normal from Randall's point of view, but how about from Brian's point of view as he sits on the body frame? So to get an overhead view of what an observer in the body frame sees, we're going to use the drone again. So you can see the drone in this shot as the white quad rotor in the center. So we're going to position it directly above the merry-go-round, and as the merry-go-round starts spinning, we'll match the yaw rate of the aircraft with the merry-go-round. We could have achieved the same result by using a super tall tripod or ladder attached to the merry-go-round, but using a drone seemed much easier, cheaper, and more fun overall. So you can see that the overall end effect is that we have a camera that rotates with the body frame positioned about 20 feet above Brian's head. 
Now, let's look at that same scenario, but from Brian's perspective. So in other words, we'll use the footage from the drone that's rotating at the same rate as the merry-go-round. Before we get started, I just want to point out a minor fact. In the first scenario where the merry-go-round was rotating and Brian was throwing balls, I accidentally spun it in the wrong direction. In this current video and all the subsequent videos, we'll rotate the merry-go-round in a counterclockwise direction for consistency. Let's look at Brian's point of view using the camera that's sitting on the merry-go-round, aka mounted to the body frame. Let's also start the drone rotating to match the yaw rate of the merry-go-round. Now this is odd. If Brian watches the ball as it leaves his hand, it appears to deflect to the right. To get a better view of this, let's slow this down to 30% of real time. Again, watch as the ball leaves Brian's hand. To an observer who's sitting on this rotating body frame, it appears that some mysterious force is accelerating the ball to the right. You can see that from Brian's point of view, the ball seems to follow this quasi-parabolic trajectory to the right. We know from the previous video that Randall, who's sitting on the non-rotating reference frame, just sees the ball fly in a straight trajectory as soon as it leaves Brian's hand. We'll throw it one more time so you can see this phenomena again. Remember that both of these videos are synced up and showing Brian's point of view, aka the viewpoint of an observer sitting on the body frame. This is definitely some interesting behavior, but we see that it's really just a matter of perspective. Randall sees one set of behavior because he's sitting on the non-rotating reference frame, and Brian sees something completely different because he's sitting on the rotating body frame. In the previous scenario, we tried to make it so the ball left Brian's hand near the center of the merry-go-round. In other words, we wanted to start the trajectory from the origin of the body frame. Once again, let's slow down the video, but only to 50% of full speed this time. Now, let's examine what happens when we release the ball from the edge of the merry-go-round. Let's rename this person as Edward. E for Edward and E for Edge. Edward is throwing the ball in four directions. Radially outward, tangentially in the direction of travel, and radially inward here. And you can see that in all these cases, the ball is deflected to the right. Lastly, he's going to turn 90 degrees and throw tangentially in the direction opposite of motion, and the ball still deflects to the right. So regardless of location and direction, it seems that the trajectory of the ball is always deflected to the right when the body frame, aka the merry-go-round, is rotating in a counterclockwise direction. There does seem to be one scenario where things seem to act normally. We see that if Brian stands in the center of the merry-go-round and throws the ball straight up, everything seems fine. The main camera shows the point of view of an observer on the reference frame, and the picture-in-picture picture is an observer on the rotating body frame. In both cases, the ball rises and falls quote-unquote normally. Again, just keep this situation in mind, and we'll take a look at why this occurs when we do a rigorous analysis of the situation in the following video. The previous situations where we saw the trajectory being deflected depending on the perspective of the observer is called the Coriolis effect, and it has a lot of real-world scenarios. Speaking of real world, if you think about it, we're sitting on one giant merry-go-round right now called the Earth. And it rotates in this direction. So if we look at the northern hemisphere, this is very similar to the merry-go-round we were investigating where it spins in a counterclockwise direction. Now, let's consider what might happen if a low-pressure zone formed over the Atlantic Ocean. Now, let's consider the path of three air molecules. So initially, these are going to get pulled inward toward the low-pressure zone. We can then look at how the trajectory of these molecules move from the perspective of someone attached to the rotating Earth. So let's jump back to the merry-go-round and make a simulation of this scenario. Okay, so now let's see if we can simulate the Coriolis effect from a meteorological perspective. So I've got an example here. This is my uh, cardboard cutout of the United States here. And let's stick this on the merry-go-round up in what we're going to be using the merry-go-round to simulate the northern hemisphere of the world here. And then I've also got a... My, my horrible artistic cardboard cutout rendition of Europe here. So we'll put that on the other side and see if we can put an Atlantic Ocean in between. And we'll have balls going into the Atlantic Ocean, some from Europe, some from the east coast of the United States, to see if we can simulate um, like a cyclone. Uh, so let's go tape these down on the merry-go-round and we'll be back in a second. So you can see my horrible cardboard representation of the U.S. and Europe on the merry-go-round, and the X marks the simulated low-pressure area over the Atlantic Ocean. Unfortunately, we didn't get a super clean take of this demonstration. It's surprisingly difficult to synchronize three people throwing simultaneously on a rotating platform. But anyway, we'll slow this way down to 10% of real time so you can see what's going on. As you can see, from the point of view of someone sitting on Earth in the Northern Hemisphere, these balls, which represent the air molecules, curve to the right as they move inward. If these were air molecules, eventually they would settle into this counterclockwise spin around the low pressure zone. 
And if you don't believe this is a real thing, here's a photo taken above Iceland by the Moderate Resolution Imaging Spectroradiometer, or MODIS instrument, on board NASA's Aqua satellite. And it shows this large cyclone formed from the Coriolis effect. In our simplified example, the drone is playing the part of the geocentric NASA satellite because unless I get a ton more subscribers on my YouTube channel, all I can afford is this $500 drone, not a $952 million satellite. So seriously, if you want to help me out, please hit that subscribe button. I'll just sit here and wait until you hit that button. Did you subscribe? Sweet. Since we're using drones for this discussion, let's look at another situation where the Coriolis effect can affect the navigation of aircraft. In the old days before GPS, aircraft used to navigate using an inertial measurement unit, which used an accelerometer as a critical sensor. Effectively, an accelerometer is a device that measures accelerations in any direction. So if you wanted to fly in a straight line, say directly north from East Texas to Minnesota, you might think that if you start off pointing north, all you have to do is ensure that there are no lateral accelerations and you should be good to go. However, we now know that if you do this, the trajectory of the aircraft from the perspective of an observer on the rotating reference frame, aka Earth, will bend to the right and you'll end up one state over to the east in Michigan instead. This simple technique of navigation is a form of dead reckoning navigation and needs to be corrected for effects of the rotating reference frame. Again, if you don't believe me, here's real live footage of a small drone flying straight with no lateral accelerations. I'll play this a few times in slow motion so you can watch how it curves to the right. The classical example that demonstrates the Coriolis effect is the case of artillery or a projectile traveling on a rotating frame. In fact, the first documented analysis of the Coriolis effect was by Italian scientist Giovanni Battista yep. Riccioli in 1651 in connection to artillery. So in this scenario, if we shoot a projectile at a target and naively point the barrel directly at the target, the shot will miss as the projectile curves yeah, to the right if you're in the northern hemisphere and to the left yeah. if you're in the southern hemisphere. Number two. Okay. However, if the shooter corrects for the Coriolis Ready? effect, Ready. in this case by aiming a little bit to the left, they can successfully hit their target again. <laughs> Good fish. Boom, headshot. <laughs> and again. This <laughs> effect. <Yeah>. And again. <laughs> and again. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Nice. nice. So I hope you enjoyed this demonstration of the Coriolis effect. The next step is to perform a rigorous analysis of the physics behind this so we can mathematically describe what's going on. I hope you'll join us at our next video where we're going to do exactly that while trying to simultaneously jam in more Star Wars references. You can get to that video by just clicking on the link right up here. So with that being said, I'll leave you with a famous quote by an anonymous physicist and great mathematical philosopher who said, Be sure you like, share, and subscribe to my channel. I hope to catch you at a future video. Bye.